Welcome. Uh, I'm Alan Lloyd with the Energy Institute, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Ed Manti, Group Vice President and Executive Advisor, Corporate and Strategy and R&D. Um, Ed's full bio is in the printout, so you will see that. I think it's uh, particularly uh, a good time to have someone from the auto industry here. They're facing some unprecedented challenges in terms of zero emission vehicles, autonomous vehicles, shared vehicles, as well as continued global challenges. Um, I think also, by the way, uh, we're very pleased that uh, Toyota joined us in one of the winning awards from the Department of Energy uh, to look at hydrogen at scale. So hopefully we will be seeing some of their fuel cell vehicles running around campus uh, uh, in maybe in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, so we're particularly appreciative of that. I think Toyota has always been a leader, I think, in the concern for the environment in my interaction with them over the years. Uh, they have always been at that forefront and one of the leaders. And I think now they're either at the um, largest auto manufacturer or close to it in the world. Um, also, I think it's important to recognize at this time the uh, industry, as you probably see from some of the papers, uh, the industry has facing a dilemma. So some of the industry is saying that we want to build cleaner cars, but the administration says not so fast. I'm not going to ask Ed about uh, that the, tonight, but I think it's another challenge uh, that they face as we address uh, the role of transportation and the role of vehicles in the environment. So it's great pleasure, Ed, to welcome you here to the SNG Symposium. I don't think we've had, since at least I've been here, we haven't had good representation from the OEMs. And with Toyota moving its corporate headquarters for North America from Torrance, California to Plano, Texas, I think it was announced in 2014, started to come over in 2017. That's in addition, of course, to the plant that they have in San Antonio um, where they make uh, trucks and I guess where they started the, the Tundra, which is a bit controversial at that time, I understand. But anyway, Ed, real pleasure to welcome you here and look forward to your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me today. Uh, as uh, Dr. Lloyd mentioned, um, I'm with Toyota up in Plano at our headquarters. I came down to Texas about three and a half years ago. Um, I had spent 25 years with Toyota R&D in Michigan. And what Toyota R&D in Michigan does is we develop uh, six vehicles that uh, are probably, you could say, too big for the Japanese market. That would be the Tundra, Tacoma, Sequoia, um, Sienna, we do the Avalon, and we've done other vehicles, specialty vehicles in the past. One of the vehicles that I developed was a electric, battery electric RAV4 uh, with Tesla. Uh, we uh, put the electric Tesla's electric powertrain in and their battery pack uh, at the same time they were developing the Model S. So I spent a lot of time out in Palo Alto with them developing that. The car was exclusively sold in uh, California to meet our ZEB mandate in California at the time. And so uh, I'm happy to be here tonight and uh, I'll explain uh, some of Toyota's uh, sustainable mobility efforts with a focus on zero emissions and some inherent scalability advantage of our fuel cell powertrain. So I'll also touch on the potential of such electrification technologies to scale up to a Texas size solution, which uh, we're happy to partner with you on that. So we'll start with the increasingly acknowledged need for transformable, transformable 
uh, transportation discussing some of Toyota's corresponding sustainable uh, targets and our progress, progressive electrification efforts, including zero emission fuel cell vehicles and the importance of intelligent e infrastructure, powerful pilots like we're doing with you, and also op operational considerations like the total cost of ownership that uh, we have to achieve in order for this to go to scale. And as mentioned, I'll wrap up with a snapshot of some Texas opportunities. The urgency for cleaner transformational transportation is clear. Pollution and carbon reduction needs are severe, growing, and global. And to be effective, solutions need to scale holistically across fleets, facilities, fuels, and regions. And that's true here in Austin and down in Houston, both C40 clean uh, covenant cities, the same as Paris, London, and LA. So what does transformational transportation look like? For Toyota, it means intelligent, electrified, connected, and sustainable mobility. Starting with transformable, transformational clean energy and supported by accessible infrastructure and harnessing hybrid-based electric uh, vehicle core to deliver smart, harmonious, society-benefiting transportation solutions. So we believe that our core hybrid powertrain, which came first with the Prius, with the internal combustion engine, that same technology you replace with the fuel cell, and then that can be scaled up between, uh, from passenger car like the Mirai, to a pickup truck, all the way up to a class eight truck, and even beyond to, uh, in the future, to probably marine, uh, locomotive rail, and uh, even building type of applications. We believe that there's a huge uh, scalable breadth of uh, application. But to start with, this is our Toyota uh, Environmental Challenge 2050. So we have these six uh, challenges that Toyota uh, set. Uh, first is uh, new vehicle zero CO2 emissions challenge. This is in the future. Uh, at this 2050 uh, type timing, we want to have 100% uh, zero CO2. Next is life cycle zero CO2. That means that including the CO2 that would go into the vehicle, we want to be net uh, CO2 zero during manufacturing and post. Then this is uh, at the plant level. This is minimizing uh, water usage. And then this is uh, recycling uh, systems. And finally, we want, we have this overall goal of challenging, uh, establishing a future society in harmony with nature. So this is a global target for Toyota that we've announced already. And we're taking step-by-step -step progress towards this. So, uh, it can't be implemented kind of all at once. So if you, if you don't make any progress and then you suddenly want to do a step function to try to implement, it's not going to work. So we're implementing many trials and step-by-step -step implementation of this uh, process. So here we kind of show, as I mentioned, uh, the optimal path to green as a progressive portfolio-based one, featuring uh, synergistic scaling electrification that leverages modular complementary technologies like hybrid electric, battery electric, fuel cell electric, which takes us towards the zero emissions via a customer needs-based approach. With a spread of electrified solutions, delivering the right tool for the right job. If you just try to push something into an area where it's not needed or it can't be economically justified, we're going to have difficulty with that. 
So eventually we get over here to these uh, longer range, uh, higher variety routes and heavy cargo. So we're working on some of these uh, projects uh, currently. And so uh, we're starting kind of with the, the Mirai and we're going up and down from the Mirai. So this is uh, the, the plan view here of the Mirai and it's showing the various uh, components here. So it's a very modular uh, architecture and it uh, uses our proven Prius style hybrid architecture where we swap the internal combustion engine with the fuel cell to deliver, deliver smooth, silent, swift, zero emissions comfort uh, with just hydrogen. And it's currently on sale in Asia, Europe, in here in North America. And it is already making strides. In California, so far, we've sold about 5,000. And we're, those are racking up many uh, zero emission miles in customers' hands. And as the uh, number of hydrogen stations increases, uh, the market demand will increase also. This is the scalability of that solution. So as I mentioned, it's the backbone. So when we go to what we call the portal truck, oops, excuse me. When we go to the portal truck, which is the class eight, we're using two of the Mirai fuel cells in here and uh, uh, quick charging type battery uh, in this class A truck. And then we are also working on a transit bus currently in Europe and also in Japan we have a delivery vehicle that we're working uh, with uh, 7-Eleven on. And then we have also some other, uh, a bus project in uh, Japan also, all using uh, fuel cell technology. And by using fuel cell technology, you don't stress the electrical grid infrastructure either because you can put a high amount of energy into the vehicle through the uh, hydrogen uh, refueling. And our partner on, uh, oops, excuse me, sorry. Our partner on the fuel cell truck is uh, Kenworth, which is a, a, a major diesel provider, but they also have some advanced uh, electric technology that they're doing, and we selected them as our partner for this uh, fuel cell truck. Uh, so for e-growth, uh, it must be supported by intelligent, efficient, and uh, future-proofed infrastructure, uh, able to synergistically and flexibly energize and spread electrified vehicle technologies to give customers wrestling with how to electrify for the best tool for the job today, tomorrow, and in the future. You can't leave stranded assets in the customer's hands. Uh, so one of the things that we're doing in uh, the Port of Los Angeles is we are installing what's called a Trigen station here in the center. And what the Trigen station is, it's a molten carbonate fuel cell. So we're using uh, biomethane for the fuel stock and we're making hydrogen, heat and electricity and water from that Trigen fuel station. And we're using that for our port portal project for the trucks and we're also using it to generate hydrogen for all the Mirais that are coming from Japan. They're shipped, they can't be shipped with a full tank of fuel for ocean transit, so we then will refuel them with this uh, station at the port. So this also helps benefit the port of Los Angeles where it is a, a, has the very uh, poor air quality, I'm sure Alan knows this, 
uh, that it's one of the worst in the nation. And so this is uh, to help the port also to uh, get cleaner air. The uh, Trigen uh, generates uh, uh, two megawatts of electricity and then a ton of hydrogen. These are our partners that are working with us on this uh, pilot. So it takes a village to really do a big pi uh, pilot. And so uh, California Air Resources Board provided some uh, money to help us with this. The partners had to kick in uh, money also uh, to do this. So Kenworth, Toyota, and Shell are uh, all our partners on this. These are the carriers. So our transportation division is using it to ship, ship vehicles. Uh, Southern uh, counties uses it to move uh, freight in the shipping containers out to warehouses. And then uh, 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 TS, TTSI is also using it to uh, move containers. And then UPS is uh, going to be using the truck also as a partner. And the project included uh, our fleet of 10 uh, Class A trucks, and these are currently being built uh, this year and next year, and they'll uh, go into operation shortly. We have two of our trucks currently in operation, two pilots, but for this, uh, project, the fleet of 10 will go in uh, starting next year. This is a uh, press activity that we did out at the port uh, showing our uh, first few trucks that we've done, uh, showing the potential for the hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, the acceleration of the truck is better than the diesel. The NVH, the smoothness of it is better. The noise and vibration, the driver says, hey, when I go home, I don't feel beat up. So there's a lot of kind of ergonomic benefits for electrified powertrain over diesel also in addition to the clean air and the uh, Our goal is to uh, well, I should have mentioned before I left that slide that um, it, the, what we call the shore to store will include our fleet of 10 fuel cell electric trucks, uh, five heavy duty hydrogen station, uh, four operators, three uh, duty, rugged duty cycles, and then the goal of uh, uh, real transformative progress. So that's our goal for the project. As I mentioned, the uh, acceleration is better than uh, uh, the diesel. Uh, we are using what in Toyota world we call Kaizen, which means continuous improvement. So this is the uh, first truck that we built. Uh, we kind of did this clandestinely without any support from Kenworth or anyone else. We bought a, uh, we ordered a truck without a diesel engine. And so later when we did reveal to uh, Kenworth that we we're going to show this uh, publicly, we brought them on board and they said, yeah, we were wondering why someone would order just a truck with no engine in it. And they thought that we must have been a competitor buying it for, for benchmarking reasons or something uh, not so good, but anyway, they, they helped us uh, as we got as we got brought them on board, and they gave uh, provided us with uh, kind of the next generation chassis uh, advice on how to better uh, make the truck complement what we were doing. And so they're a good partner for us on this. And then we're you can see that we uh, also increase the driving range from 200 miles to 300 miles. So within the port or within the Los Angeles basin, this 
is enough mileage that they can operate the truck all day long on any of the routes without having to refuel during the shift. They only need to refuel at the end of a shift. And the re advantage for uh, the fuel cell truck over a battery electric is that the battery electric can uh, only operate for one shift and then it needs to go on to recharging. Whereas this can operate easily two shifts and if you had some need you could operate more than that. So, so, so far, uh, we have uh, about 12,000 miles on our uh, first truck, and uh, the second truck, we are uh, just kind of on the road. Uh, there's a lot of demand for our partners. They want to use it to demonstrate to their shareholders and others uh, what this future is going to hold, because uh, honestly, this, it's a very kind of conservative industry that everyone wants, they want clean air, but they also uh, want it to make economic sense. So there's a lot of convincing to go in this direction. So uh, we already have a proxy for some uh, kind of bridging from traditional technologies to new technologies. And one of the bridges is what we learned from the LA Ports 1000 truck natural gas drage fleet. Uh, that they had issues kind of with refueling and stuff with that. So that's why at the beginning we said we needed those five hydrogen stations to make sure that uh, wherever the trucks were, uh, they would be able to be refueled uh, to meet customer uh, demands. And so the Port of Los Angeles uh, has a goal of adding 10,000 zero emission drage trucks by 2035. And so we know that we need to have uh, uh, about 10 stations to support a fleet of 1,000 natural gas trucks. So this helps us in kind of understanding how many stations and uh, pumps we're gonna need for this large scale implementation. This is the total cost of ownership model that the trucking companies use. So you can see the components of total cost of ownership that the driver cost is 43%, fuel is 21%, the truck cost is 16% of the total, and then that's expected to go up by about $12,000 due to uh, GHG uh, two compliance needs. These are the operating expenses like insurance and maintenance and that type of stuff. And then there's uh, some other. So we're looking um, as we scale this up to get the price of hydrogen down, that's one of the key elements is to get the price of hydrogen down. And the fuel cell electric truck has an advantage that the maintenance cost is probably going to be substantially lower than diesel trucks based off of some of our initial investigations. So uh, to make this uh, pilot work out in California, one of the key critical uh, elements was incentivization by uh, California, the state of California. So since they had this uh, goal, they are, have an incentive of about $300,000 per truck 
and this comes to the end customer uh, who buys the truck. And so this helps uh, the people that are investing, like Toyota and Kenworth and others, to pay for our R&D and the cost uh, uh, increase over what a diesel uh, truck would cost. So you can see these various incentive uh, chart that is based off of the weight of the vehicle. And then the fuel cell uh, truck is here. This would be a uh, any type of truck that is over 33,000 pounds GVWR. So we, we receive interest from many people that says, hey, you know, we want to do a pilot too, we want to do a pilot too. However, uh, getting a pilot, you know, it, it, you need to kind of make it a win-win for everyone. And so you have to have some government backing uh, to make this a win-win for everyone during these initial stages. So this slide takes a look at the potential overall operational outlook for heavy duty fuel cell electric. The top line projection is that uh, higher short term costs can be countered by higher earnings and vehicle offsets. So the initial cost of the vehicle is more, but uh, eventually the total cost of ownership should be uh, reduced. And long-term uh, scaling advantages can lead to sustainable overall adoption. Likely the key pacing item will be the rate of infrastructure growth. While it's still measured, the slope of the curve has been favorably increasing as providers like Shell are attracted by high continuous consumption scale ec uh, economics of heavy duty hydrogen. Along with the higher throughput of fuel cell electrics due to their quicker refueling time, which uh, unlike sig significantly slower battery electric fast charging doesn't degrade the durability or efficiency of these powertrains. This uh, slide shows some of the potential applications like cargo handling, like forklifts, yard trucks, container carriers pictured here, tethered fleets like centralized seaport, airport, and landport uh, commercial distribution centers that can leverage and amateurize the common e-infrastructure without massive constricting cables associated with batteries. For reasons like this, the cost association associated with uh, charging downtime, switchovers, and employee management. And currently there's about 20,000 fuel cell electric forklifts operating with zero emissions in North America at companies like Walmart, BMW, Cisco, and Toyota. And uh, the fuel cell uh, forklifts are particularly uh, good in refrigerated warehouses because battery fuel, uh, battery forklifts uh, in the freezing temperature have very degraded performance, whereas the fuel cell uh, forklifts don't have that degraded performance. In Europe, uh, Germany has uh, announced this uh, fuel cell uh, train that they're uh, working on and I believe UK is also uh, developing this uh, fuel cell rail towards their 2022 ZEP targets. This is showing uh, kind of the hydrogen demand uh, per day there. So here is the German application of these uh, rail applications. And then beyond uh, rail, we have the marine applications like I mentioned. So to go to marine application, you need to uh, 
probably go to liquefied hydrogen because of the uh, long range that you need. However, this is a huge uh, potential uh, application for total greenhouse gas uh, reduction that Marine is currently 36% of the port emissions at the Port of Los Angeles. Of course, there are other applications and uh, there's many people, including Toyota, looking at other applications that uh, could possibly uh, be used, including uh, drones and freight delivery and uh, auxiliary power supply and that type of uh, application. So this is uh, the on-site uh, Trigen station. Uh, this one was not is not at the port. That's under construction now. But here we have uh, some other uh, applications of stationary uh, fuel cell projects. Uh, before we moved out of uh, California, we had uh, on-site uh, fuel cells uh, at our California office. So as we put the picture together across these facilities, fleets, applications, and regions, we see the potential for scalable, versatile, and available hydrogen to help electrify global supply chains towards zero emissions in coordinated concert with complementary battery electric solutions. So we want to have synergistic, standardized, and future-proofed poly generation E infrastructure. And I'm not here today saying that hydrogen is the only solution because battery electric has a place too. And if it's shorter range, smaller vehicles, there's a place for it. So I'm not here to just say this is the only solution, but there should be a suite of solutions. And so this, uh, is gaining global momentum across uh, the whole world. Japan, Europe, North America, China, Korea are all elevating their hydrogen efforts and ramping up their R&D uh, investment, their incentives, their station counts, standardizing distribution and broadening their application. So when at the beginning, I mentioned that this Texas kind of opportunity, uh, we are helping support a project that maybe uh, is uh, going to apply here to the campus where we will provide some Mirai vehicles for a hydrogen fuel cell project uh, here at University of Texas. So we're looking forward to supporting you on that project. So this project was awarded by Department of Energy, uh, I believe it was about a week ago, wasn't it? Right? Okay, in August, and uh, it was called Demonstration and Framework for Hydrogen at Scale in Texas and Beyond. And so this will include uh, looking at hydrogen, natural gas, wind port infrastructure, infrastructure, uh, geological assets, uh, and others for down here in Texas. So in summary, we've seen that electrification must be an intelligent, versatile e-mobility solution that must scale across fleets, facilities, regions, and application, a holistic ecosystem approach backed by full stakeholders, including the government, community, and industry. And like our transformational heavy duty at scale, shore to store fuel cell truck pilot. This uh, powerful green print for a zero emissions roadmap we see as expanding uh, across the world. And so we're supporting Japan in 
this type of application to other parts of the world. So with that, I would like to open it to uh, Q&A, if I could. There's a microphone roaming, so. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, my question comes about, uh, so you did touch on it uh, the second to last slide. Uh, the supply chain for hydrogen in the hydrogen economy you're proposing, uh, it's, right now it's primarily petrochemical, right? Um, how do you get around the fact that while you're, while you're developing hydrogen generation sources, you're also encouraging a large amount of, you know, extraction to supply the hydrogen you would need as fuel for these generation systems? So currently at the scale that we're operating, we can offset that by buying uh, biomethane. So when you buy biomethane, you're taking that methane that would normally go into the atmosphere, you're capturing it, putting it into a pipeline, and then you're using that. So from a carbon point of view, uh, there is no uh, additional drilling going on or anything like that. And California has indicated that our trigen station is ZEV because we're using biomethane. In the future, the biomethane may not be enough for scale, so then you have to look at other types of uh, hydrogen production as in electrolysis or other types of methods. Or you have to do carbon capture. You're taking biomethane and then um, oxidizing it or doing some, some sort of syngas reaction to get the hydrogen, yeah. hydrogen out of that? Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. It, it does release CO2. The molten carbonate fuel cell does release CO2, but it's, uh, as I say, in the methane that would go up into the air, it would be going up regardless. Um, I guess my question was in regards to the kind of the, you, you mentioned sort of the life cycle cost of the vehicles and how fuel was a very high percentage. I was wondering if you had any insight into, so that rebate is only 300 k for the vehicle. And I know the fuel cell vehicle is going to cost a lot more than the diesel. Um, but I know the fuel currently costs a lot more. So I'm just wondering how, 300 k didn't seem like it may not be that big of an incentive at the end of the day, especially given fuel costs, which are probably going to dominate. The, I've looked at transit buses a lot and yeah, the fuel costs and driver costs completely dominate the cost of the vehicle. So just really any idea of how much incentive that is. It seems like there needs to be a fuel incentive, not necessarily a purchase price incentive. Uh, for that second. question, can you also just kind of set up a scale for the cost of a big, uh, large-scale truck? 300000 sounds like a lot to people, but... Yeah, so... Uh, uh, class A truck is depending what options you get, like 100, 120,000 in that type of range. Uh, diesel. For diesel, yeah. For fuel cell, it's, it's a lot more. Probably 10 times. Yeah. Uh, so let's see, we're looking for cost of ownership. Um, so the yeah, that was it. Yeah, so you can see the uh, driver costs, which um, there's a lot of other people that are working on autonomous or autonomous trucks, or they're looking at uh, platooning or other ways to reduce the, the driver costs up there. Uh, some of the ports uh, in other countries, they have actually used autonomous vehicles at the ports or they have changed their cargo handling to automate the cargo handling using uh, kind of robotic type pickers and stuff. Um, we decided on this project not to attack that cost element. 
So your comment on fuel costs, uh, it's correct. We have had uh, discussions with uh, California Air Resources Board about how to uh, manage this uh, fuel costs in the future to make sure that we can have additional people uh, kind of sign up for this. And so that's part of this pilot is to look at from this pilot point of view, what is the true cost? And then from there we can decide kind of the, the roadmap for the future. So uh, of course, if we were able to get more incentives, it could lead to faster implementation, but we're taking it one step at a time, including the state of California. They wanna understand the facts before you go to the next step. I can't share it. I believe there's an incentive uh, to the purchaser yes, to the, kind of buy down the fuel cost for them over the life the of the vehicle. The fuel cost is included in the your purchase of a Mirai. Okay, I'll go. So I was wondering, like, what are your thoughts on battery-powered electrification in heavy-duty trucks versus uh, fuel cells? And, like, where do you see the future would be? Or is it that hybrid-based vehicles for, uh, for heavy-duty trucks would, be, uh, would have a much bigger market share? So if you're comparing fuel cell truck to battery truck, it depends on the range and the weight that you're carrying. So you can do a back of the envelope calculation and see that if you want to uh, have an 80,000 pound truck and have any range, you're gonna need about 10,000 pounds of batteries in it, which takes away 10,000 pounds of your cargo capacity. So the truck operators need to haul both volume and weight. And some people in this world say that, oh, they're only concerned about volume. It's not true. When you talk to the actual truck operators, some of them max out the weight of every truck going down the road. And so uh, that weight is uh, critically important uh, that our fuel cell powertrain is substantially less weight than a battery electric powertrain. At, at what point, Ed, will you make a decision on whether it's a go or no go in terms of this, this segment? I'm aware of obviously some other companies are uh, looking at the fuel cell, um, uh, sort of Nikola and, and some others there, but also there are probably many more looking at the, at the battery side of things. So. Um, at what point are you likely, likely to look at this in three years, five years? Yeah, I'm not ready to publicly say when we will go to that. However, these people that are our competitors are also collaborating with us. Because if you remember when battery electric passenger cars first came out, there was like a a Japanese standard for charging and a US standard and a European standard. So for these heavy duty trucks, we are working with our competitors to make a heavy duty fueling protocol so that wherever you are in the world, you can go to a heavy duty hydrogen fuel station and uh, fuel up any uh, truck that's made by anyone in the world. So we're working with them. So even though they're competitors, we're using a SAE uh, committee to develop a heavy duty fuel cell protocol. Uh, so yeah, we know who our competitors are. We're working with them. You know, we don't get into fist fights or anything. You know, we, we respect them as competitors and uh, uh, they have their roadmap of when they're coming to uh, market and we have our roadmap when we uh, may decide to come to market and if we decide that. <clears throat> Ch 
China has jumped on virtually every clean energy technology and have they expressed an interest in what you're doing or have they launched their own independent effort in hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, China has a very big play now on hydrogen, especially they've kind of come to the same analysis that we've come to is that heavy duty truck should be fuel cell over battery electric and they are working in that direction and uh, um, I don't know all the, the market dynamics of who all the players are there so I really don't want to comment or speculate on who's doing what in China either so but you're correct that through they're getting tremendous support from uh, the central government to develop uh, hydrogen stations, hydrogen trucks, and the like. Thank you, Ed. I'll go back to the question that has already come up around batteries and fuel cells, but from a different angle. If you take a step back, go back, let's say, five or even ten years ago, when this whole discussion was even at an earlier phase, even battery-based electric vehicles were really just in the very, very beginning phase. How the recent developments of the last five, seven years have changed the thinking within Toyota of that dynamic between battery versus fuel cell electric vehicles? Well, uh, going back a ways, one of the reasons that Toyota wanted to kind of invest in fuel cells was because we did some very early studies uh, that showed their potential. And it took us a long R&D path to get to the stage that we are with the, the Mirai and this truck. Uh, So we studied kind of the battery electric, you know, I did the project with Tesla, so we kind of know what the technology uh, capability was. And Toyota will have battery electric cars in the future too. We'll have a, a full suite. As I mentioned, it depends on the application, uh, where you are driving, what the customer expectations are, what the range expectations. Uh, so we will have uh, our feet in both camps there. Um, so I can't say that we would have just picked one or the other because uh, you can't always on future technologies just pick a winner and, and do a rifle shot. Sometimes you need to have a, a broader portfolio so that you don't get left behind if if you're technology doesn't pay out. Ed, could you comment on the role that um, hydrogen and Toyota may play and we would see in the 2020 Olympics at Tokyo? Um, I was told to stay away from that because there will be a separate press dis <laughs> announcement, so I can't. This is all going on YouTube, so I can't answer that question. But it's positive. Yes, positive. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so in regards to the lighter duty vehicles that are uh, battery electric vehicles, um, so batteries only have a lifespan of like t like 10 years maybe and they can be expensive for people to replace and so at that point it might be like more economic for someone to just buy a new car and so I'm wondering if more people start to drive battery electric vehicles if you foresee um, a re reduction in used vehicle market um. I think uh, the bigger play there will be uh, the transportation network companies because they are going to be putting on a high number of miles in a short number of years. 
So that is going to kind of take some vehicles uh, and shorten their life. The battery electrics, uh, Toyota and other companies are looking at how uh, to have a second life for the batteries, um, either so whatever that means, either by using them outside the vehicle or or differently within the vehicle, but um, I think not only Toyota, but other companies too are looking at what you're pointing out as an issue. I think it it's a little bit early for me to comment on what we're doing in that space, but I think a lot of people acknowledge that that's an uh, issue. And I don't think that we want to have kind of a disposable car either, so we're trying to address that because the, you know, I started with our uh, long-term goal and one of them was recycling, so uh, just throwing batteries away is not a solution. You have, to, they're not good for the environment. So we have to figure out a recycling plan uh, for those or how to reuse those batteries uh, after they finish their first phase of their life. No, she, they're recording it, so you have to talk into the microphone. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Ed, based on your experience of what incentives you get from California and sometimes a stick in terms of the ZEV mandate, and looking at globally what's going on, what advice would you give Texas regulators and um, policy makers to encourage zero emission technologies in Texas? Uh, so, like I mentioned here, it has to be supported by the government through some type of incentive program, or um, it's going to be very difficult for businesses to say, hey, I want to do this pilot or whatever else, if they're bearing 100% of the cost. Um, it can be very expensive. So. Um, in this pilot phase, as we're working out the bugs, it, uh, it's helpful to have some incentive money uh, to support that. In, in the ports of Los Angeles, uh, in Long Beach, they cannot expand their port until, uh, based off of uh, legal restrictions mm -hmm. until they use uh, zero emission trucks. So they have huge economic incentive to uh, adopt zero emission trucks for their future expansion, which they want to do. So they have reason from their economic model to support this technology. Uh, so one here is it's the question that was asked earlier. Is there a, do you see an inherent advantage or disadvantage, or how do you think about the trade-offs of the full life cycle in terms of recycling batteries versus fuel cells just due to the the way they're made, and, or, or is that too hard to tell? No, uh, we think that fuel cells uh, are going to be easier to recycle because the electronic components are similar to other electronic components that get recycled, and the fuel cell it itself has uh, uh, not so uh, nasty materials in it. It's similar to uh, like a catalytic converter that they all get recycled because of the value of the materials. Thank you for joining us and coming down all the way from Plano. Uh, great presentation. So can you talk about maybe the market spaces that you see? You talked about battery electrics and such not um, for light duty. Um, you already have been creating, what, two generations of plug-in hybrids sold successfully, one of the most popular plug-in hybrids in the country. Um, where do you see the market niche or dynamics for the plug-in hybrids versus the pure battery electrics and light duty? So in all honesty, uh, the marketplace is very challenging to us. I'm not talking from an engineering perspective. I'm talking from a customer point of view. So how long has the Prius been out there in the market? A long time. So 
uh, still customers do not want to buy a Prius because they don't want to plug it in. This is the standard Prius. And we tell them, uh, you don't plug in the standard Prius. It generates its electricity during coast down or when the engine's running. They say, really? And so that's today's customer that the vehicle's been out there for 20 years in today's customer. So when we have shown customers plug-in Priuses, they say, I don't want a plug-in Prius. And in the Northeast, we're, by law, we're re required to have some zero emission vehicles, you know, basically a plug-in vehicle. Uh, at some points, we have to price the plug-in vehicle with, at less than a standard Prius price to sell it, to meet our regulatory requirements. So from an engineering point of view, it, that's not the problem. It's, a, it's working to kind of educate the customers. And so last week I was at one of our dealer meetings uh, with all the Toyota dealers across the country, and that's what one of the focus points were, is that we need the dealers to better educate their salespeople how to educate the customers on hybrid technology. And then when you get, finally get them educated on hybrid technology, then you have to get to plug in or to BEV type technology. Because you have these technology uh, people that probably all you in the room are, but then you have the rest of the population that they're, they don't want some new technology. They don't want to, uh, plug-in Toyota or even a Tesla or something else like that. They want the, the same thing. And that's the majority of the U.S. population. And then one more question. So fuel cells and batteries have made phenomenal progress in the last decade or two. Um, there's a rule of thumb that some people use for batteries. I know it's been faster than this over the last decade, say 5% improvement per year, but is there any rule of thumb that you see for the continued progress um, for the fuel cells? I mean, the Mirai stack is such, it's like a suitcase now. It's amazing. Do you see 5% at least improvements in yeah, cost I can't, per I year? I can't quote any numbers because it's confidential, but I can say that in the standard Toyota uh, way, every system is going to be better than the last. If you look at our internal Combustion engines, every Corolla, you know, going back 40 years, if you look at each generation, the engine block became uh, lighter and more powerful uh, generation after generation. And as engineers, it's our duty to make sure that progress continues on every technology that we touch. That's our job as engineers. Thank you for your time and uh, coming here. Um, I have a question regarding long distance transport that you touched on earlier in the presentation. Um, you mentioned liquid hydrogen, and I'm wondering if Toyota has entertained any other types of uh, fuel, um, specifically possibly liquid methanol, um, or if you guys have looked into any other possibilities for long distance transport. Uh, uh, NREL, I believe, is doing a is NREL, I believe, is doing a methanol study now. Toyota, we are not uh, doing our own internal study. So I think if you want to look, it's better to look at the NREL study. Is there a viability at all for um, electric conversions or conversion from ICE vehicles to battery electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles? Um, it's possible. Um, so I'm a car guy. So I was chief engineer for Avalon. I worked on uh, Andra, Sienna. I've worked on it. So this is relatively new getting into uh, these uh, class 8 trucks. So all I can do is explain kind of what my partners explained to me about the business. So this is, I'm not an expert in this field, but they're kind of saying that trucks over time, they migrate 
to other parts of the world after they finish their useful life in the United States. So in the United States, they have the first owner who is typically like a big fleet operator. They have a target of X number of miles and they turn over their truck, even if it's in perfectly working order, they have a standard that says, at this point in time, we sell them. Then there's a, a second tier customer or that buys these trucks and the, they buy them at a discount, obviously, and they have to spend more money on maintenance. But there's this progression of life cycle of trucks through various customers. And so could, those, could that original truck be retrofitted to a new powertrain? It could, but um, from what I've heard is that probably the customer would rather have a new truck because the truck cost is only 16% of their total cost. So they'd rather not have to deal with other systems that may be failing, they would rather just get the whole truck new under warranty if you're that first uh, truck owner rather than do a retrofit. Will there probably be retrofit companies out there in the future? There probably will be. I mean, uh, currently there are people that uh, rebuild and retrofit diesel engines. It's part of the standard life cycle of a diesel truck is to rebuild the engine. Um, so will it happen? Probably it'll happen, but I, I don't know whether it'll happen initially, you know, like in the first 10 years or not. It'll probably be a little bit beyond that from a business model point of view. Just my guess. I'm not an expert. Um, so, uh, Dave's question about the technology advancement got me thinking about this a little bit. So, uh, I guess when it comes to fuel cell vehicles, I'm sort of a believer it's not necessarily a technology hurdle right now, but it's a cost hurdle. Um, infrastructure is one side of it, but I was wondering on the fuel cell, on the vehicle side, um, what, what, Where's that like critical mass, like like where economies of scale might come in that bring down the cost of the vehicle, the fuel cell, the hydrogen storage tanks, everything, and it may be on your whatever your timeline to 2050. Where where does Toyota think that might happen? You know, is it in the next five years, ten years, or how many cars or trucks? Any any yeah, idea or insight into that? that yeah, uh, I'm not really at liberty to say where that kind of tipping point is. Of course, that's kind of very uh, but obviously 5, right, you're correct. <laughs> you're correct. If you think of how many vehicles are made in the world, that's a drop insignificant number. So you have a tremendous amount of R&D and infrastructure for a very few number of vehicles. Okay, thank you, Ed. Thank you for a great talk and great questions. <laughs> thank you.